invitation. Uh, as it has been mentioned, I've been here twice in the Institute. We, uh, we were studying pretty close the Irish example, not because of the close affinities, both historically and culturally, but also because uh, uh, when we were entering the Union, we were looking at different uh, cases of different uh, countries, how well they uh, used the possibility of membership. And obviously in the 90s when I was here, you know, uh, Ireland was one of the best examples, you know, the, 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 the miracle of the Celtic tiger. And we were, we were looking at your experiences. We were trying to uh, uh, follow in your footsteps when it came to using uh, the EU funds. In the 90s, it looked much better than later on. It seems that there were much more positive uh, lessons to be learned. But I think that even now we look, uh, after a certain share of problems, we look uh, to Ireland quite often because uh, you are the case in point of how to deal with difficult circumstances, how to show determination, how to be able to, uh, to benefit from European integration even when the going is um, a little bit tougher than, than before. Uh, so we look at uh, Ireland with, with, with you know, quite a lot of uh, hope and uh, we try to learn all the lessons, mostly positive, as I've said, but also certain lessons that, that, can, be, um, that can be omitted. And on many issues we see eye to eye, uh, and that's why uh, when I speak to my colleagues in the council, you know, I always seek for the Irish point of view. Uh, we consider ourselves being the Mediterraneans of the East, you are the Mediterranean, the Mediterraneans of the <laughs> North, and besides all the other cultural affinities and, that everyone knows about, uh, I think that it uh, is sometimes uh, easier for us to talk to each other than sometimes it is to talk to some of our more hard-headed partners. Uh, recently a poll was conducted in Dublin, Ireland, uh, with a question whether the recent enlargement had any adverse effects on the labor market. 76% of the respondents in Dublin answered that, well, yes, I mean, the recent enlargement of the European Union had certain adverse effects on the labor market. 24% said that, nie, nie miało to żadnego wpływu na rynek pracy. So, as you can see, these affinities are even stronger when it comes to the participation of, of uh, some of our citizens in the development and economic growth of Ireland. And when I talk to my, because I came here from, from London, when I talk to my British colleagues, when I want to make them angry, I always tell them, uh, if you want to talk immigration, maybe you are going to study the Irish example, uh, and then maybe we can move beyond politics into the realm of, of real problems, which are not as serious as one would predict. Uh, anyhow, I'd like to, tell, to, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Polish experience and, and tell you a few things about how I see our role in the European Union and how I see uh, our European policy and then tell you a little bit about the institutional dilemmas that are before us. And to be absolutely frank, I think that I have more questions to put to you than answers. But maybe then during uh, uh, our Q&A session we can... Um, dig a, a little bit deeper into some of those problems. Uh, first of all, I think that we uh, have done quite a good job in the past 10 or 15 years when it comes to integrating ourselves with the European Union. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, at the end of the 90s of the previous century, I was responsible as a think tanker for preparing a uh, uh, a study, uh, I was participating in it, uh, which was entitled Cost and Benefits of Enlargement. We were trying to foresee in 1998, you know, what would be the costs and benefits of our, of our, uh, of, 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 of enlargement of the European Union. And I think that um, it was very difficult for us to foresee all the consequences, but we were much more pessimistic than, than, than we are now. I mean, we wouldn't have predicted that we would do so well in the European Union and that the stereotype of a poll would change so quickly um, all around Europe. Uh, because I think that 
the most important thing that we've gained, uh, and this is not just me uh, being cocky and too happy about myself and about my country, but that perspires from all the conversations that I have with my friends, German, French, Irish, British, and so on, that uh, we uh, convinced our partners that most importantly we are a very credible member of the European Union. I remember you know, this joke which was made uh, during 2002-03 uh, when we were negotiating accession. People were saying that you know, with those polls we will have only problems because they will be as terrorizing as the Spaniards, as arrogant as the French and as optish out as the Brits. And I think that we proved uh, that uh, it's not true. First of all, you know, we are not optish out. We try to participate as much as possible. And if one agrees a certain policy with us, we deliver, and we are credible. We are not going to change our mind three times after we've agreed on something. Sometimes we are a difficult partner uh, and, uh, and hard-headed, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that we are not constructive. And we try to bring forward arguments, and we try to work <laughs> for a compromise. And as I've said, I mean, this is not me praising my own uh, country's negotiating tactics, but this is what comes from, uh, from our uh, friends. So we are constructive, uh, and uh, we think that we need to work together towards strengthening the European construction. We are not dogmatic, however, and I think that this is a proof of our maturity, uh, that uh, if you were to ask me whether we need more Europe or less Europe, I would simply say it depends. I mean, there are definitely those areas when we need more Europe, uh, when it comes to economic coordination, for example, and you know, those are the lessons learned from the economic crisis. Uh, when it comes to energy union and energy independence in today's geopolitical climate, incidentally, we were working on it you know, eight or nine years ago. I used to work in the European Parliament first as an advisor, then as a member, and we were preparing a report on energy security in 2007, and our friends were telling us, eh, you're obsessed, come on, we don't need it. I mean, this will be perceived by Russia as, uh, as anti-Russian, and, and we are just preparing in 2008 under, under German presidency, big opening, you know, four, four spaces of freedom with Russia and so on and so forth. We really don't need it and stop being obsessed about energy security. And now everyone tells us, you were right all along. So, I mean, there are definitely those areas when we need more integration, but there are also those areas where we need less integration, when there is too much regulation, where the union regulates in areas where it shouldn't, <laughs> either because, uh, either because uh, it simply doesn't have the right competence, or because, or as I, as I put to you, because it simply is too costly when it comes to the public perception. I'm going to give you one example. Do we really need to uh, be very specific in our regulation about tobacco uh, and talk about the packaging, how it should look like, and whether we can smoke slims or menthol cigarettes? I mean, is it really a competence of the union? I mean, health as such? And I'm not talking about, you know, whether this regulation makes sense or not. I'm just talking about whether it should be regulated with such a detail on a European level. Second example that I always use is, 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 is a regulation concerned with the uh, power of the vacuum cleaners. That, you know, the more powerful vacuum cleaners have been for forbidden. And again, it makes sense because we want to save energy. But do we really want these kind of... Uh, directives and regulation to go through, which costs us dearly when it comes to the perception of the public opinion. Incidentally, I had uh, the biggest row with my wife because she told me that as a politician, you know, I was completely useless. Uh, I should have chosen a different path in my uh, in my life. And on top of, of that, when I could become use, useful and buy a stronger vacuum cleaner three days before the regulation was in place, I didn't even tell her. And everyone in Warsaw bought stronger vacuum cleaners, and we are stuck with ours, which is not as strong as it should be. At least that's what my wife tells me. So as you can see, I mean, there, is a lot of <clears throat> there are a lot of areas in which I think that, that the union regulates uh, too much or, 
or too heavy-handedly, uh, and I, I think that it's good that there is a re refit program now. Uh, it will be probably treated much more seriously by the European Commission, where Commissioner Timmermans was charged with, uh, with that file, with that dossier. Second thing is, besides not being dogmatic, is that uh, we are not fixating on any partner in the European Union. I mean, we obviously we use all the possible formats, such as the Weimar Triangle, such as the Visegrad Group, and so on, but we try to talk to everyone. And, you know, the, the, the reality of the European Union is that there are a lot of shifting coalitions, and uh, sometimes we do things with the Brits, sometimes we do things with the Irish, sometimes we do things with the Visegrad Group, sometimes we do things with the French and the Germans. Obviously, we use the potential of all of, the, of, of all of those. Weimar Triangle is very important for us as the Visegrad group, but we are not uh, fixated on just one partner. I think it is quite natural that, you know, when you want to know the position of our partners, uh, you're immediately concerned with the position of Germany or France because, you know, and, and, and Great Britain because they're the leading countries in the European Union, but uh, we want to know the position of every other member state uh, because... Uh, only through that, I think, you can be uh, effective. Uh, when it comes to the dilemmas that we have before us, as I've told you, I will more or less sketch out the dilemmas without giving specific answers, because it will be quite difficult to give those specific answers. But I will share with you my uh, assessment for what will be the, 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 the questions that, that we are, uh, that we will be asked to tackle together, especially when it comes to the institutional setup of the European Union. First of all, I would say, you know, that there is always this tension between effectiveness on the one hand and legitimacy on the other. Our problem, uh, our biggest problem is that when we didn't have uh, full, to use the academic term, input legitimacy, we always had the output legitimacy. We were delivering. And many people were saying, yes, the system is complicated. Yes, people do not really understand how it works. But they support the European uh, construction because it delivers on so many fronts. The problem in the previous years was that it stopped delivering. And we had problems with delivery. And then, obviously, uh, that weakens the whole construction. So the most important thing, the most important task before us is to do our utmost to start delivering on uh, the promises that we've made and... Uh, that we start meeting the expectations of the people who elected us for the jobs that we currently hold. And this really is important. I mean, I remember that everyone was saying uh, when we were preparing the Constitutional Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty, this will save the day, you know, because we need the institutional reform. And I was, as a humble think tanker, I was saying, ah, oh, come on, come on. I mean, it will create quite a lot of problems, a lot of institutional tensions. It will not resolve the problems that we have with economic coordination. I mean, for example, the new voting system. I mean, is it really about democracy? It's about, you know, changing, uh, changing, uh, shifting power and so on and so forth. And I remember that I was attacked by some of my friends at different conferences who were saying, oh, you're young, you don't understand the European construction. Lisbon is about strengthening the European construction. It will resolve most of our problems and we need it and so on and so forth. Do we need the changes which are there. Of course we do. But, I mean, first of all, it is true that we were concentrating on the things which proved to be of secondary importance because we should have, should have uh, concentrated on the questions of economic governance, and we haven't done anything on that for, for, for the previous years. We just started it, what, two years ago or three years ago when the crisis hit us. And secondly, it is also true that even though we, we desperately need the reforms of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, some of the problems were not resolved, and some of the problems I would even submit to you were uh, made even more difficult because of the high complexity of the institutional system. Uh, and now, uh, when it comes to the tension between legitimacy and effectiveness, this is a problem that we are going to have for years to come. Because on the one hand, <coughs> we want to legitimize the construction, we want to strengthen you know, the democratically elected the European Parliament, we want to have more transparency and so on and so forth, yet with 28 member states and with the Parliament being a co-legislator, it is very, very difficult uh, to deliver on that promise. And more and more is happening, uh, more, more, more and more of, of the decision-making 
is made in ways which are not totally transparent. But we are more effective thanks to that. <clears throat> the question is how to, how to balance the two. Uh, you know, there are many good cases in point, but for example, you know, how the decisions are really made in the Council, which now is a creature of the Prime Ministers, and how European Council is being prepared. Uh, it is hellishly complicated. And it doesn't go through a normal, Euro normal machinery of the, European, of the Council of the European Union anymore. Look at the European Parliament, how the decisions are made. Almost everything is done in a first reading through trialogues. Uh, where only the guys who are in the loop take the decisions, the rapporteurs, the coordinators, and so on and so forth. And when a given thing hits the committee, I mean, usually most of the decisions are already made informally. And there is no time for the normal due process to, 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 to take hold, because people, because of effectiveness, they want to take decisions as quickly as possible. Look at the European Parliament, you know, after the rise of the Eurosceptics. Most of the things are now even more than before, <clears throat> of the things are done by the big coalition, by the great coalition. And I've been a coordinator of the EPP, so I know how it works. You know, just coordinators sit, they do a deal, and then they present it to others. Because that's the effective way to go about, and that's why we have effectiveness. But is it fully, you know, transparent and fully leg legitimate? I mean, there, there are questions. I mean, there's always this balance to be struck. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, with the rising Eurosceptics, I mean, we have more of, of that trend. And sometimes, you know, we complain about the Eurosceptics, but we do not react to that. I mean, we uh, do decisions, uh, we, 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 we take decisions as if nothing happened. And sometimes it's difficult, you know, to sometimes you see the difference between the socialists and the, the, the Christian Democrats in the European Parliament, but then when it comes to decision-making, those differences are not that apparent. Uh, and sometimes we regulate as much as we did before, not taking into account that people, not only those who vote for Eurosceptics, but people at large, sometimes are tired with overregulation coming from, from, from the European Union. And that's why I think that this will be the, the biggest problem that we will have. We definitely need that effectiveness, but we need to strike the right balance. And it's in, in a system, in an institutional system, which is so hellishly complicated, it will be difficult. When it comes to the uh, uh, challenges brought uh, forward by certain EU institutions themselves, uh, again, I, I, I think we have more problems and more questions than, than answers. And it will be, we will be uh, living in a very interesting time uh, observing how institutions change. Incidentally, I started working uh, as a think tanker uh, in ninety six ninety seven, and my first job was to... Uh, study the reflection group report and then preparation for the Amsterdam Treaty. By the way, one of the books that I've read then was a book done here, an analysis of the Amsterdam Treaty, <clears throat> which sort of, you know, uh, went into detail uh, that I was studying then. And I remember that my boss told me, well, after Amsterdam Treaty is done, uh, you have to uh, start researching something different because that will be the end of the institutional hmm. reform because that was supposedly that was the treaty which was to prepare enlargement. So you better start doing budget or something else, because, you know, institutions, I mean, we've been reforming them since the single European Act. Come on, for 10 years, it's enough. And then what? Then we had, you know, the, the Nice Treaty, and then I was working in the Ministry of European Integration in Warsaw, and we were studying the changing uh, system of votes weighing. I don't know whether you remember Chirac when he wanted to give us less votes than the Spaniards, and then he said that it was a mistake of his secretary who was uh, um, putting the numbers into the tables <coughs> and so on. And again, my boss told me, okay, but after Nice, come on, that's going to be it. Yeah. I mean. And then I got uh, elected to the European Parliament, and he said, well, go to the Constitution Committee because no one knows it, but, I mean, you will be bored to death because now nothing will happen there after Constitutional Treaty, <coughs> you know, after Lisbon and so on. But you have to be there, but then you will do the real job in the internal, uh, in internal market committee. And then, again, you know, we had changes, two-pack, six-pack, and so on. And it seems that we've done everything we could with the changes of the treaties, yet all the institutional, system, all the institutional problems are still on the table. Relations between European Council and, uh, and the Council itself. New president of, of, of uh, the European Council, whom I know pretty well, 
whether he will de behave differently, whether he will use some of the potential of the treaty that was not used by Van Rompuy, for example, when it comes to foreign policy, what will be his relations to Mogherini? Mogherini herself, will she make use of the commission hat more often than Ashton, than Lady Ashton, as she says she would? What will be the future of the um, external action service? Uh, the commission itself, I remember that when I was talking to some of the specialists, they were saying only the commissioners with portfolio would matter. The vice presidents will not matter because you know they have no bureaucracy to, to uh, help them implement their ideas. And now look, I mean, the Juncker plan, investment plan, is prepared by Katainen, not by Moscovici. Energy union is prepared by Sefcovic, not by Kanyeta, and so on. So there is a big enigma how this new two-tiered commission will really work in practice. It will probably be more politicized. It will probably be much more focused, which is good, because Juncker and Timmermans published the 10 10 priorities, and they said quite openly that the union has, cannot do everything. It has to focus on things. It will probably be, uh, the regulation will be much wiser. They will not over-regulate, and sometimes with the refit program, it will even think about uh, stopping some regulation that has already been made. But how it will work in practice, it will be a big question. And also, what will be the re re relations to the council? Will it be less dependent on the council? And will it cooperate more closely or more politically with the European Parliament? Uh, those are really very, very serious questions. And without treaty change, we will have quite a lot of shifts in the institutional balance of the Union. Uh, and it is sometimes hard to predict how these shifts will look like, and sometimes it's hard to predict what would be really good for the European uh, integration as such. Especially that, as you know, the, for example, the President of the European Council, which is essentially an intergovernmental creature, doesn't behave in an intergovernmental way quite often. Uh, I don't have to tell you that because you're experts and specialists, but I mean, there are no easy answers how the system will develop, and there are more, ans there, there are more questions than, than answers. And a lot will really depend on chemistry between people and uh, on how assertive certain people are, whether they have uh, clear, clear ideas of what they want to do, how determined they will be, uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. Uh, so those are, those are basically the questions in, uh, before us. Uh, and also, I mean, quite a lot of questions about concrete areas, deepening internal market, uh, what to do about investment, energy union, uh, treating seriously digital agenda. I used to be a minister of digitization and administration before I, I, I shifted into this job, so I know this quite well. Uh, European Parliament, again, uh, with the changing uh, composition of the European Parliament, uh, there are quite a few questions how it will operate in uh, reality. Uh, especially, as I've said, you know, with the a big grand majority, how it will treat the fringes. I mean, we might not like some of the fringe parties, but I think that we have to take into concern, take take into consideration the concerns of the people who elected them. I mean, if, if you are going simply to close our eyes, I don't think to, to some of the problems, I don't think that we are going to be better off. I think that, you know, the recipe is, first of all, as I said, not to be dogmatic, and this is what characterizes the Polish position. I try to think pragmatically what will be good for the development of the European integration, take into account uh, what uh, our citizens tell us, uh, and try to, uh, try to uh, respond to their fears, especially in the changing times where people communicate differently. I will give you one example. You know, I was... Uh, uh, preparing, preparing. I was responsible as head of the campaign for our mayor of Warsaw four years ago, who was deputy uh, chairwoman of our political party, Civic Platform. And you know, she was preparing the program, and I said, "How about if we were to check what the citizens want themselves, so that if you know the politician will not speak ex cathedra?" What she thinks should be done. And he says, how should we go about it? And I said, let's check what 
do people search for in Warsaw on Google most often? So we did it. And it turned out that uh, who was really most active in Warsaw on Google and who was asking the biggest amount of questions on how the city works? I mean, everyone expected young people, you know, the one well-connected and so on. No, single mothers. Those were, th th this was the biggest group of, 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 of active citizens on the net asking questions about how the city really works. Because, you know, they left, they left their smaller cities, villages and so on. They do not have a close contact with their family. Usually, in the old times, you would ask your mother or your aunt. And now you ask the all-knowing Mr. Google. And it turned out that, for example, the biggest problems for them was that you know they they, they couldn't change the diapers of their kid when they were in a uh, you know doing business in the town hall, uh, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that actually tackling tackling problems which seemed secondary for a politician uh, were much more important than than you know huge investments in another bridge in Warsaw. So in a sense, we have to. I mean, you know, this is a simple example, but I mean, we have to learn. To, because now the communication, especially when it comes to social media, is two-way. I mean, no more a politician can tell his citizen what he wants because he's just all the wiser, but he has to engage in a conversation. We have to do it in the European Union because if we don't, the gap, especially that you know, we are weakening sometimes legitimacy for the sake of effectiveness, we have to do it in order to, uh, to deal with some of the problems that are before us. <clears throat> uh, at the end, I will, will, will tell you that the worst thing that can happen to us is that we are going to have a lost decade in the European Union because of the economic crisis. I mean, look at Japan. Uh, I mean, this is the greatest threat that we have. I mean, if we are not going to be ready, if we are not going to find niches for development which will propel growth and investment, if you're not going to treat seriously uh, the potential of internal market, digital, and so on and so forth, we are not going to, to develop quickly, and we are going to lose a decade, just as Japan did. And I think that we cannot afford it, especially that our citizens expect something much different. And uh, I think that Ireland is a meaningful example, and, and we look at you quite often, because, because <laughs> your message to Europe was, was, was a message of determination. And even though you find, find yourself in a, in a difficult situation and in dire straits, uh, you proved... Uh, that you can do something about it if you're committed. And I think that many of our friends in Europe, we in Poland as well, need that, uh, that example. Uh, simply fueled by the knowledge that hard work will pay off. And also trying to concentrate on, on, on real problems, not concentrate on, on, on political problems which are invented, such as immigration. That's why I tell my friends to watch the Irish... Uh, example. I mean, I think that we shouldn't be fueling anxiety and fear, but we should show determination and show that we have answers to some of the problems that we have in Europe. And that's what we should try to, to address. Uh, and it is addressed here quite well. That's where our eyes are, are, are quite often on you. Uh, and the links are being strengthened. And some of those Poles who got the right know-how in Ireland are coming back, opening up businesses. I've heard that there is a uh, kindergarten in Warsaw which has uh, Gaelic as a language because people want to keep up you know, the uh, things that they've learned here, not only the know-how but also culturally. So yes, I mean, we are becoming in Poland a little bit more multicultural, which not always for a Catholic is a badge of honor. But we are trying to change that also and try to be as open as possible uh, and, and, and to use that as something, um, you know, depicting the, <coughs> the road that we've taken quite a few years back. Mm. And as I've said, it's always good to talk to our Irish friends because uh, <coughs> your views are, are, are always refreshing, which cannot be said about some of our other partners that I will not mention by name. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>